<clears throat> Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Dr. Dominique Baptiste. Welcome to Biblical ETV. Well, guys, you know what? I know this works. <laughs> Praise God. It's nice to have um, some things working, but I know this works. And I do apologize for the audio. Uh, how dare it, right? Especially since we're getting such a good word. Praise God. Welcome back. Praise God. Thank you so much for rejoining us. Amen. We made an edit to the um, the sound tonight, and we'll get that fixed, or we'll just give you some different software. <laughs> Praise God. I don't know why, but you know, I do know why. The enemy is always trying to fight us, because I teach the word of God. Amen. But you know, we win. We win. The battle is won. Amen. The victory is won. Praise God. We win. I tried a new software. And um, it just did not work for us. So we're going to either, they're either going to fix it or we're moving on to something new. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. So let's get in this word. Amen. Last night we were talking about the return of Christ. Praise the Lord. Welcome. Amen. Many blessings to you. Amen. So last night we were talking about the return of Christ in First Thessalonians chapter four. Praise God. And tonight, amen. Um, we're getting back to the book of Ezekiel. Amen. We're going to talk just a little bit um, about the visions that Ezekiel saw. He saw four primary visions. And we're going to talk about those and how just God moved through him so tremendously with visions. Amen. If you're a person who has visions and oftentimes you're a little, sometimes people are confused. Sometimes people are shocked. Sometimes people think that, oh, that was a dream. <laughs> oh, that was a dream. <laughs> Amen. And God is really trying to tell you something. Praise God. And then you realize a year, two years later, that you're doing more than dreaming. Amen. But you're seeing the future. You're seeing what God has put before the body of Christ. Praise God. So um, I know that when many of us come into our ministries, especially when it is a spiritual ministry, I mean, many people are preachers and teachers and evangelists, praise God. And, the, and those are, um, they're, they're spiritual, but they, they, they're not like the gift of prophecy, amen, or the office of the apostle, which is blessed with many, many gifts, right? So they they're just they're just different you know they're more tactical thank you lord more tactical gifts amen versus more kind of spirit led gifts um not saying they're not but you guys understand what i mean um for example the gift of a prophecy you don't there, there's no book of, of prophecies that you go over and read to someone you actually hear in the spirit the word of the lord and you have to trust the word that you heard and speak it Amen. Now, some of us like to say, oh, you have to validate it book, chapter, and verse. Well, you know, book. there's no book, chapter, and verse where God wants to heal that tumor inside of your body. You know, and then the person goes, oh, my God, how did you know? Because the Lord revealed it. It's a word of knowledge. Thank you, Lord. Amen. He revealed it. Or to say that, you know, this is going to happen in six months or we see the need for prayer over this city for this reason because there's about to be transformation. There's about to be, you know, a plague that hits the world. <laughs> Amen. Or there, there's there. Ex we're going to experience violence in this area. We need to pray peace over this area. God told us to go in this area and proclaim peace. Now, that's the revelation of the Lord. So when you hear that and you just go do it, right? You know, you're looking like, hmm, Lord. <laughs> you know, and when, and when your prayer is heard and when the prophecy works, let me tell you what happens. Remember that man, <laughs> remember that man named Jonah? Mm -hmm, him. Yeah. See, Jonah heard from the Lord. Through many trials and many troubles. Praise God. He did. He heard from God. And he went and did what thus said the Lord. God told him, go tell that city called Nineveh. The man in Nineveh, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to destroy your country and all your people. So what he did not anticipate, he did not anticipate was this. Now, he did not anticipate that when he went and proclaimed the glory of the Lord, he wanted the hammer to fall on that country so bad he didn't know what to do. He had been through so many trials and tribulations. He was like, God says he's going to destroy this land and he's going to destroy the leadership and all the people and the pets because, you know, you guys have do not seek him. You don't honor him. You're going to catch it, right? That's what he told him. Praise the Lord. Welcome, my sister. Amen. And so, um, so he comes and, and he goes with this word. And what happens? The city hears him. 
the king hears him. And he tells the people, we are going on a three-day fast, that perchance God will hear and he will have mercy. Now, see, this is really an effective prophet. But he wanted, he wanted his words more than anything. He honored his words and his experience coming before that more than he honored the, the, the mercy of God. What happened? So the the king of Nineveh, what does he do? He tells the people, we're going on a three-day fast. Don't feed the kids. Don't feed the animals. And you don't eat. Everybody, let's pray. Turn our hearts to God. Because we know this is the God that does things. He shows up and he changes. Amen. Things. He's destroyed many countries before us. Amen. Many people before us. But he always brings redemption for those who will repent. He says, so let's go pray and fast before the Lord, if perchance, and I love that word perchance. He said, if perchance, he will hear us and have mercy on us. What happens? God heard them. God had mercy on them. And Jonah's words did not come true. Was he a true prophet? He was a true prophet for sure. <laughs> and then was he called there by God? He Not only was he called there by God, he was literally put in the belly of a well and dropped off on the, on the, on the coast. Praise God. Amen. The well threw him up right there on the coast. And he said, you, he said, this is what the Lord says. Right. And so now his words were true. But the outcome was different than what he had anticipated because he was judging after the after history. He was judging after the flesh. Right. But God, hallelujah, always judges man after the heart. The hearts of men turned to the Lord. Amen. And when they did. Right. What happened? They repented. <laughs> they God didn't destroy them. He was destroying them because of their sin. But God forgives a repentant heart, honey. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And thank Jesus. Hey, amen. That he doesn't hold that. He didn't hold their past against them. And yes, their past was only 72 hours old. It was, it was only 72 hours. I know we think that, oh, they got to live holy. They got to hop in. You got to do this, do this and do that. But God. The minute you repent, it goes in the sea of forgetfulness. The minute you repent, it goes to the east and to the west. Never to be up or heard upon you again. The minute you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are saved. Amen. Are you say so so you know, does God hear a deathbed confession? He sure does. <laughs> Amen. Does God hear one that just says, In the moment, Lord, forgive me. I was wrong. Yes, he does. And what does he do? He forgives. Amen. And the judgment that once was going to fall doesn't. So here's what happens. The word of God came, came to pass. Amen. Because the judgment always comes with God. God always come with what? A way of repentance. When it's from the Lord, you know, oh, you know, it always comes with a way of repentance. God always gives you a way out. Amen. There's always a way back to him or to him in the first place. Praise God. So when this when this prophet named Jonah went to Nineveh, amen, and he prophesied as the Lord had told him to, amen, and the people heard it and they repented and God forgave them, amen, and gave them another opportunity, right, to continue, to, to continue in the way of serving him, amen, then the people were saved and the prophet was mad. <laughs> the prophet was mad. He was mad. People would probably look at Jonah and go, he, that didn't come to pass. That's not God. But see, the king knew. The people knew. They knew that they had fallen on their face and asked God to forgive them. They knew that they had fallen on their face and asked God to cleanse their heart. They knew that they had asked God to make them whole again. Amen. Or make them whole the first time. Whichever one it is. Praise God. Amen. Then they knew that. And because knew, they knew that and they saw that. Amen. They knew that this was the Lord. They have been changed. Hallelujah. Amen. And they have been set free. But here, somebody might say that Jonah was a false prophet. But we know that he was not. I mean, because God even asked him, he's like, what's wrong with you? The people repented. They got saved. Yay. You know, and Jonah said, look at what I've been through. Look at all of this. <laughs> you know, I've been burnt by stomach acid. You know, all the smells and all that stuff I had to go through for three days. For this? He said, that's right, for them to repent, for them to turn their hearts to me, for them to surrender their souls to me. Remember when Jesus said this, just like um, Jonah had been in the belly of the well three days, so shall I be in the earth. 
Amen. Remember that. You know why God picked that up? Because it, his being in the belly of the whale and surrendering to the plan of God. Amen. Saved the lives of so many. And Jesus wanted us to know, amen, yes, the three days is significant. Praise God. Yes, being in the belly of the well is significant. But the, the greatest thing of it all is that for as many as repent, to them can be saved. That was a country that did not serve God, that served idols, that did not follow the Lord in any capacity. Right? <laughs> Nineveh was a tough town. Y'all should read history on Nineveh. That's somewhere to go, ooh. Caligula, look out. <laughs> and if you don't know Caligula, look them up too. <laughs> they just happen to make a movie. So if you've seen that movie, you know. And historically, it is correct. Full of sin. Lost. Perversions. <laughs> and I mean, you know, perver <sighs> creepy stuff. <laughs> All right, stuff that we incarcerate people for in this day and age. Right? What's going on over there voluntarily? My God today. But the Lord. Had God or sent a prophet in the land. Amen. To prophesy to the people. Amen. To speak the word of God to the people. Amen. Caligula was a Roman country. Amen. Nineveh was. I'm not sure. But it was just. It was another country. God can save. Amen. And he can redeem. And he can make whole. So tonight I want you to think about that. Amen. Keep that in mind. Because as we talk. As we continue our discussion about Ezekiel. How long have I been on here? As we continue our discussion about Ezekiel, amen, you have to understand that he's talking to a lot of people that don't read, amen, a lot of words that were never written down, amen, um, a history of God and the miracles that he was accomplishing, amen, and people just did not know, praise God, but God, look at yourself again, give yourself that look and go, but God, <laughs> amen. And hear God say this, that to as many as call upon him and that call upon his name, they shall be saved. Praise the Lord. I just want to check my time. Amen. It says I've been on now eight minutes. So that means I've got time. I can go in here and let's see here. Yep. Eight minutes. So we've got time, y'all. Let's get it. Hey. So Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a man. Was was a prophet, praise God, that saw visions, right? And so Ezekiel's visions, be encouraged, amen. God knows what he's doing. You continue to speak the word as God gives you to speak it. Amen, amen, young prophet. And I say young not because you're young in age, but because you're young in ministry. Do what God is telling you to do. You are on point. Praise God, amen. Lord, just keep in mind that God's prophets have a pattern. They always come with redemption. They always end with repentance. I mean, it's God's desire more than anything to see his men and women and children come to him. To be, to be saved more than anything. In the flesh, we will, that's what they're going to get a good whopping, you know, in the spirit. But the Lord is like, I don't want to whop them. I want them to repent. I don't want to get them. I want them to come back to me. I want them to turn their hearts. That's God. God is a God of love and compassion and redemption to as many as will hear him and will obey his word. He loves us all. He chooses us all. But amen. Repentance and obedience is a requirement to be restored into the kingdom. Amen. And we don't get to decide who repents. We have to trust that God knows their heart. Amen. Amen. Hey, you know, left it to Jonah. Nineveh would have burst into flames. <laughs> but... Leave it to the Lord. He heard their cry. He heard the cry of the king. He saw the fasting and the sacrifice. He heard the cry of the people and the cry of the children and the cows and everything. <laughs> Amen. And save them because of their repentance. Amen. When you're a prophet, do what God say do. Keep in mind his patterns are always the same. Repent. And be and you will be saved. <laughs> Amen. Same thing. This is this is why I want to talk about Ezekiel tonight. Amen. Ezekiel had many visions. And as a as a um as a prophet, that's challenging. It's challenging. It's challenging. He's seeing a vision from the Lord. And then now he's gonna go and tell somebody what he just saw. <laughs> Amen. He's heard a word from God, and now he's gonna go and tell someone what thus saith the Lord. Amen. And they can't see him and they can't fact check him in a book. Right? And that's what he did. His four visions. Um, matter of fact, the book of Ezekiel starts off with visions. And he says this. He says, while I was among the exiles at Kedar, at the Kedar, by the Kedar River, 
um, the heavens open and I saw a vision of God. Amen. We have to trust that what we see and what we hear, praise God, comes from the Lord. It says, <clears throat> it is urgent that I think we scan the visions um, before we really get into any any further so we can know kind of in detail what was going on. Ezekiel first. Amen. Bless you, man of God. Amen. Amen. Ezekiel first. We see Ezekiel, his, his first vision, um, chapter 1, verses 1 through 313 and it says this a vision of the four living creatures praise god amen there were a vision of the four living creatures that appeared before him they had unusual faces you know each one um with a general appearance of man you know and the purpose of the vision is kind of twofold what to commission him into his service one that's the number one reason that he's there right for the commissioning of him into his service and to impress upon him the need for assimilating the word of God that God spoke to him and giving them to the people, right? It was a need for taking the word, making it relevant, and then giving them to the people. Um, note that I want you to pay attention to that. The scroll that he ate in the vision in chapter um, three and one, you know, it says this. <laughs> Let me get this so I can see it here. All right. It says, moreover, he said unto me, son of man, eat that Eat that thou findest, eat, and then go speak unto the house of Israel, right? So that meant that every word that he not only heard, that he saw, but that he partook of it. And as a minister of the gospel, amen, we want to break down what it means how to study the word, amen. And that's one of my key scriptures for teaching people to study. When he said he saw it, he took it, he ate it, and then he went and spoke it. So what does it mean to see the word? Praise God, literally get it in front of your eyes and read it. Amen. He partook of it, which means that um, he began, to, he, well, no, he ate it. Amen. He, he took it in. He read it, right? And he began to digest it and let his spirit process it. Then it says, as it talks about him partaking of it, that means that not only did he eat it, amen, but he said he let his body, his spirit man, process it. Now that you've processed it, that means that you've gone into detail. What are you saying, God? Lord, speak to me. God, even the things that I don't understand, open my eyes to them. Right? And now, the Lord said, now go and give it. Amen? So, Ezekiel chapter 3, for those of you trying to figure out a way to teach, um, studying the word, that's a good one. Um, and then, it helps us to understand, amen, what God was saying to him. <laughs> I think the un the unswerving obedience to God's will... Um. To God's will of the creature symbolized in this in this particular passage about um, Ezekiel is fully understood. Their their movement um, was single was as a single unit. I mean, it's a picture, right? That is per God perfectly executes. Now, something that's beautiful. I mean, think about it. It is beautiful. You have you know these these. Um, flying creatures, flying creations. Um, he called them creatures because he had never seen any people type, people body types fly, right? And then not only that, they flew and they they spiraled as as they went, you know. And that that's beautiful within itself. Um, it says their movement was as a single unit before the Lord. Ezekiel and Revelation are often alike in their symbolism. Um, the feature, the feature like, of uh, the features of a man, you know, upon a throne. That's Ezekiel 1 and 26, um, who is the son of God, praise God. And then the appearance of the rainbow on the, of the rainbows that we see on a rainy day speak of the covenant that we have with God and God has with us, that he will never destroy man ever again, right, <laughs> um, by water, praise God. But I think it's, it's, it's rev, rev, a revealing of just his promise towards man to bring salvation to us. Amen. And that he's offering us salvation to as many who will hear him and who will receive his son as Lord. And then the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds, you know, on a rainy day spoke of the covenant that God made with Noah. You know, he he says he said it'll be fire next time. So, and that's even um in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 4. What we see what the symbolism of fire yet once again. And then it spoke of God's spirit. So, 
in Revelation, you know, all of these things appear and Christ figures prominently in all of Ezekiel symbolism. So if we want to fully understand and fully know um, the, the true revelations of what God is saying to us through Ezekiel, amen, we have to think of it, what they heard at the time, right? And then what we'll hear now, because we are post Bible. Right. It has been written and it has been given to us. Amen. We are post Christ. So we know, amen, that everything that we saw and that he spoke was yet still a revealing of something about God, something about his promise to his people, and then something about the promise to us eternally. Right. Because we also have Ezekiel and Revelation pulling together. And that's called studying. Right. Next, you know, we see the burning, um, the vision of the burning vine. Now, and that's Ezekiel chapter 15. So the first one is Ezekiel. Do you'll see the, um, oh, I can't go to the burning vine yet. <laughs> we saw the vision of the cherubims, right? And the four faces of the, of the man. And, and I know that they talk about, um, you know, how we see the four faces and the four faces are reflection of, you know, the prophet, the man, the, let me pull it up real quick. Da, 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 da. That's all right, guys. I I know this. So the prof, the eagle, the man, the lion. And I'll get back to it, cause cause it's it's in here. I just I have notes in front of me. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but we do see the the glory of God in all of it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. All right. So next we see the glory of um, of God and his goodness, right? The glory of God and then the godlessness also of others. So before you, and that's in chapter 8, verse, and then through chapter 11. I'll just, we'll just go there. Chapter 8 through chapter 11. And, you know, before the siege of Israel, before the siege of Israel, Ezekiel is given an extended vision that shows the people's abomination in defiling the sanctuary and the contrasting glory of God. You know, abominations occur um, throughout this entire segment section, you know, and then the glory stands sh in sharp contrast, right, of what he's trying to show Israel of how they're being led into captivity. So if you read Ezekiel 8, um, verses 1, really 8 and 1, all the way through 11 and 25, you see just that sharp contrast, you know, abomination by, by, the, by the people of Jerusalem. And then you see the glory of God sharply coming against that. And yes, revealing the Lord all the more at every level. Amen. So that, that's um, the vision number two. Vision number three is the vision of the burning vine. And in the vision of the burning vine, that's in Ezekiel 15, 1 through 8, um, the vine becomes a symbol of Judah. Um, and the vine is burning, um, and it's really the burning of a useless vine that bears no fruit. <laughs> Sounds like a parable of Christ, doesn't it? It bears no fruit. Um, and in the and it is a part of, it's revealing the destruction of the people. The abomination of Jerusalem um the abominations s of Jerusalem, um, they are so great that they warrant a more severe punishment. And the visions of doom that follow that are followed by the parable, you know, of the unfaithful, <laughs> see, <laughs> Amen, of the unfaithful of the unfaithful wife. So Israel was Jehovah's bride, right, who had forsaken God and gone a whoring after other gods. You know, the love of idols rather than the love of God is what caused Israel's downfall. So when we look at, you know, chapter 15 and chapter 16, chapter 15, 1 through 8, and then chapter 16, we see the vision of the burning vine. We see the judgment of the Lord. We see God showing them that everything that you thought was good is not. Amen. He burns a, a useless vine. And think about this. Think about the, the parable of Jesus or the um, historic event that happened with Jesus when they walked up on the fig tree. And the fig tree was not bearing fruit, but it was fruit season, right? And Jesus rebuked it, and then he cursed it. And when he did that, he says, you'll die. 
you'll die and it burnt down right and what's the Lord, what is he telling us he's telling us that if we will not bear fruit right if we don't bear fruit during our season of bearing fruit then there's there's no there's no and then we're like the the like the the um the the fig tree which spoke back to him it's like kind of like and <laughs> right that rebellion he just he said okay you won't you won't do anything you'll just die in the by in the same day it died so same thing the lord is telling them here because you have gone a whoring after um idol gods because you do not bear fruit right he says i'm bringing judgment and same thing with Jesus, right? He shows us the exact same thing. Amen. Except he walked it out. Ezekiel just had a vision. And then he told then he told the children of Israel what it was. Um, next thing is we see the, the fourth one, the fourth and last one, is the valley of dry bones. Ezekiel in chapter 37, verses 1 through 18. In this vision, in this vision, right, this is the fourth vision of Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel sees a great valley filled with dry bones and this was nothing unusual. I know he's like, Oh, he read about a valley of bones. That's, you know, like that's, that's not unusual when people had wars at that time, they didn't necessarily bury everybody. Amen. They put them somewhere out of the way and left them there to become dry bones. You know, now if they were praise the Lord, welcome my sister. Welcome. Amen. So if they were there to see, Amen. Then they would know. It's like, so this is a valley of dry bones. It could be at that point in time, practically anywhere. Um, and so they can it says, but for Ezekiel and the word to the children of God at the time, this was the whole house. Key word here, whole, entire, <laughs> right? House of Israel. Ezekiel 37 and 11 tells us that. And then the main lesson of this vision is the restoration of the people. So you see all of this and you say, oh, but what happens for dry bones to have occurred? Dry bones appear when the body is dead, decay has come, um, everything has been eaten away, right? The flies have gotten it, the animals have gotten it, and now the bones are beginning to dry. And that means that they've been exposed to the sun. They've got no nutrients, no no care. They're not in a nice comfy casket or any such thing. They're not even underground where they can remain wet, right? They're just dried out, right? So when you see bones that are white, right, <laughs> they, they, they're now dried out. They have no moisture, no oil, no anything. They're just there waiting for the crushing, so to speak. Um, there was no there was no substance left, no identification left to them, and so that's what the Lord was showing the children of Israel through Ezekiel. It's like there's no substance left to this place. God says now, now, now that they're all dried out, now that they've given up all, now that the idols have they've taken advantage, and they've gotten all the good meat, right? Now that the life is out of them, now that they're at their wits end, now that they've come to let, now that they've laid it all down, it's like you know I'm nothing. All right, God, I'm nothing. I got nothing left, right? Now that they've done all of that, now, <laughs> praise God, now we can, I can work with them. Now, you know, you know, when you just at your end, it's like, I, I don't have anything else to work with here. <laughs> we have, we're done, <laughs> right? So now that they're here, now I can work with them. So now God begins to work with them. He reaches down and he looks at them and he tells, he asks, the um the prophet can these dry bones live like now that they've come to nothing and they've been in captivity all this time can they live is it possible for them to be restored can salvation come to these can they be made whole again can they once serve me like they used to can they come back we look at people now and we say they lost i just don't know you know and that is what ezekiel saw he saw a people that were in all for all intents and purposes, gone, right? But the Lord, the main lesson here is restoration of God's people. God said, I can take a bone that is dried up, that has no substance whatsoever, that really is nothing but waiting to be ground to powder, right? And he says, he can make it live. How do we participate in that prophet? Prophet, how do I use you in that? We began, he told him, he said, he takes them from among the heathens, and then he gathers them together from all the countries where they have been dried out, used up, taught idol, idolatrous stuff, you know, used in idolatrous ceremonies, um, participated some on purpose and some not, you know, scattered, 
lost completely. And then God says, now preach to them. Preach life back into them. Speak to them. Tell these dry bones, you know, tell them what to do. Amen. So when we think that a person is, get, we just got to give up on them. Amen. We got to let this go. <laughs> there is, honey. There is no help for them. The Lord is still saying, yes, there he is. It is a picture also of God's power to raise those who have not only been scattered, but have been lost and who are dead in sin. You know, it's the new birth. It's the new life. It is being born again. It is the, the resurrection, amen, of Christ in us all. You know, the new birth was explained, I would say, to Nicodemus. When he came to the Lord and we get from there, we get what John three sixteen, God's promises it here. You know, if whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So he comes and he, he says, the wind bloweth as it will. Right. And so he tells him when he tells Ezekiel to prophesy to these dry bones, he's saying, preach to them, speak the word to them in your mouth is life and that more abundantly, you know, and then when it's the word is spoken to them, what happens? They come together, they come forward. They are come, they come together, the wind blows and they are filled, they're restored, amen, and then they're brought back to their land as, as, as believers that never should have gone away. So when we look at any group of people, when you go into any community to minister, amen, all of these prophecies, they all of these visions that Ezekiel had, amen, they all speak to the will of God. They all speak to God's restoration of man. They see we see judgment that it's coming, amen, in these four cherubim, right? That it's it's coming, right? We see the contrast of abominations versus the glory of God. Amen. We see the judgment of the Lord in the burning of the vines, right? But then we see restoration when it's all dried up and we thought it was all over. Here comes God again to say, no, it's not over. I'm still giving you a chance to come back to me. I still have provision for you, y'all. We never too late. We're never too late. Amen. Even when it seems like God is, you know, the world is saying one thing, but God is always saying, I'm waiting right here for you. Praise God. So the four visions of Ezekiel are four visions of restoration. Amen. They they come with the judgment of the Lord has been rendered. Amen. It's coming forward with might and with power. Praise God. Here's why. Abomination versus glory. Amen. Judgment in, 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 in action. Burning up of those things that, that are just not profitable at all. Amen. The tearing down of idols. Amen. In the hearts and minds and lives of people. And then at the very end when it seems like your dry bones ready for nothing but to be, you know, crushed and gone to sand or gone to dust. Then the Lord comes in and he says, live, I say live. Live, I say live. Come together. I speak life to you. You can live. And then when the Spirit of God blows in on the people and on the situation, mm, God brought life and he brought people, a people that seem to be lost and gone forever back to life. I don't want you to ever think that anybody that you know or you is lost forever. That is not true. Praise God. This is evidence of it. Amen. Our lives are evidence of it. Amen. The whole body of Christ, the whole world of people is still evidence of it. The world is still, amen, ready to receive Jesus. Praise God. They still need to hear the gospel. Amen. No matter what is going on in their lives. Amen. They may feel like God just doesn't want to hear from me. And they just sitting on the corner, or sitting on their steps or sitting in their car or in their homes or even in their conference room, wherever they are in their church pews and just feeling like, ah, just wait till God get here. We'll see what happens. <laughs> no, no, no. My brothers and my sisters, God says, speak to them and they can live. The preacher who didn't preach anymore, but God says, because of, and you feel you've experienced the judgment of God. Because of things, decisions that you made and actions that you followed through on. But I'm here to tell you today, if God called you once, your calling is still sure. Praise God, your calling is sure. Amen. Can you live? Yes. This is the word of the Lord. Rise up and preach the word as God called you to. Prayer warriors, amen. Ushers, whomever you are, whatever God has called you to do, go do the work that God has called you to do yet once again. Why? Because the glory of God is in your life and 
the wind of the Lord and the spirit of God is blowing on you even in this very moment. I promise you in Jesus, as sure as you're sitting here watching this, whenever you're watching it, whether you're watching it live or in the replay, whenever this is your hour of redemption or this is the hour of redemption for someone that you know, there is always redemption. But they did. It doesn't matter what they did. God saved Nineveh. <laughs> That's the proof of it all. Amen. God saved Nineveh. Amen. He told the man on the cross next to him. He said this day. This day, Not next year. Not in a few years. Not when I get around to it. He said this day. You'll be with me in paradise. That's wherever Jesus is. Hallelujah. That is paradise. Praise God. When we talked about the rapture, the rapture is just on the other side of all of this. Amen. And we either have a personal one or we have one with everybody. But whatever it is, we will be caught up to meet with him for an eternity as long as we repent and believe. Praise God. Well, guys, I hope that you guys are blessed tonight because this word blesses me in looking at these four visions of Ezekiel. Amen. They all show forth their path. Amen. Through their journey. Amen. Of being judged by God, being identified as like, yeah, we see you. <laughs> Amen. The the judgment came forward in the word. It was shown to be true through when they were measured with the contrast. Amen. It was executed for those that refused to repent and return. And then when it when it's finally it seems like it's all over, God sweeps in. His spirit blows in and he saves the day. Amen. Isn't God awesome? Amen. Praise God. God is awesome. He's a miracle worker. <laughs> yes, for those of you who listen to Gospel Radio, you know what that is. <laughs> Amen. He's a miracle worker. Well, listen, God bless you. We super appreciate you tonight. Amen. Love you in the Lord, my sis. Thank you so much for joining. Amen. We love you guys. Love you and appreciate you. Listen, if you need prayer today, Amen. I encourage you to just send us your prayer request. Prayers at BiblicalETV.com. Praise you. Praise the Lord God. Bless you, man of God. Amen. Um, if you need prayer, then also, if you want to receive Jesus Christ in your heart as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you the key scripture right here. It's Romans 10. And we're just... Wrong one. <laughs> one more. There we go. We're going to Romans 10. And it's verses 9 and 10, and it's very easy, very simple. God wants us to know how we can be saved. And I like to take people to the scripture because just when people think, you know, you go through changes in life and you feel like, oh, you know, God, I'm not saved, but you are. Because once you ask Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, you are saved. Amen. You are forgiven. Amen. Once you receive, you know, Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you are forgiven. The word says this, Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Praise God. Amen. You'll never be ashamed. Never again. I know what you did. He knows what you do to what you did too. But he says this in first John one nine, one of my favorite scriptures. It says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. And if you say you have a sin, that's not true. Right? So just confess your sins to the Lord. Ask Him to forgive you. Amen. Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. No man can do that except by the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Ask Him into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. Amen. To forgive you of all your sins. Amen. And, and you shall be saved. Scripture. God doesn't lie. His word doesn't change. Amen. Listen, I'm Dr. Dominique Baptiste. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless and good night.